Good evening and welcome to the December 8th, um, 2020 Policy Subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Pursuant to that order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the Open Meeting Law's requirement that meetings be held in public places open and physically accessible to the public, so as long as, as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and is be, will be accessible via the pu to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube, and Comcast can Channel 12. The public can access this meeting via this link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton Channels. All right. <clears throat> Next order of business, I will call the roll to establish a quorum. Uh, the chair, Mayor Sullivan. Here. Okay, Agostino is here. Ms. Azak. Here. Mrs. Mendez. Here. Mr. Minicello. Mr. Rodriguez. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Here. Okay, we have established a quorum. So for the policy subcommittee this evening, uh, we have five items of business on the agenda, a re review of current COVID-19 metrics, uh, a revisit and, re and ongoing discussion of reopening plans, winter sports, item number four uh, would be data information, uh, and then item five, any other business to come before the committee. Um, so the current COVID-19 metrics, Mayor, did you wanna? Yes, I, I would. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, the COVID numbers are still increasing at a rapid pace. Most recent dashboard numbers, and I wanna thank Dr. Herman for crunching the statistics on a daily basis, but unfortunately we are up to 320 deaths. 320 residents have, lo have been lost because of this deadly virus. Right now, we're at current active cases, 1,249, meaning 1,249 residents have positive active cases of coronavirus. And since the state started calculating, we're hovering close to 7,000 cases. Currently, we're at 6,976 cases right now. We're in a deep red classification. If you look at the 14-day uh, window, which would be from November 20th to December 3rd, uh, our daily positive case count is 8.42%. Anything under uh, or above four or above is a red classification. We're more than double. Uh, right now, our daily cases per 100,000 population is 54.3. State is saying that uh, anything over, let me just check, uh, anything over 10. Uh, Dr. Herman and I spoke right before I got on this. He projects tomorrow will be in excess of 55 so we are in uh, a lot of trouble uh, in terms of the metrics rising. Um, I was on a call last night um, with about 12 different mayors throughout the Commonwealth led by Mayor Walsh in Boston. And uh, all of us are, are seeing the same, same thing. I was on a uh, Zoom today with a regional task force that I created last month. And it's all the neighboring communities that are butt brocked and including uh, Randolph and Bridgewater, they're included in. Uh, everybody was sharing this, the same news that the metrics are going in the wrong direction. Uh, we believe that the uptick is related to some uh, way to gatherings at Thanksgiving holidays and the like. So I will tell you right now from a medical standpoint, the CEO of Brockton Hospital, the CEO at Good Samaritan, and also the executive at the VA were on a call with me yesterday. They have not been at full capacity like they are currently uh, since the early start of this pandemic. So right now we have a 48 uh, inpatient. We have six that are in the ICU right now at Good Sam in Brockton. So um, in terms of comparing yesterday to today, we're up 79 cases uh, in a 24 hour window. That doesn't mean 79 people came down with it yesterday. Uh, the tests are somewhat delayed, but uh, we are still in the thick of things here. And 
I do want to thank um, the superintendent um, who participated yesterday with myself and Dr. Herman and Eno Montessor and Linda Cahill, director of school nursing on a town hall for uh, staff of BPS and teachers. And uh, it was over 108 people participated yesterday. Uh, in the past, we had 25 to 30 people. So I want to thank everybody that's engaged in this. We need to continue to maintain what the doctors and medical clinicians are telling us what to do, wear the mask, social distance. And as you all know, I did an executive order. So city hall and city buildings are closed as of Monday to the general public with appointment only. And we're trying to, again, try to minimize the spread of this deadly virus. That's the update. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mayor, for the update. Um, obviously, that's uh, disappointing news to, to hear that so many people in our city are, are, are ill and, and it's uh, going in the wrong direction. Um, Ms. Asak, you have your hand up. The floor is yours. Yep, I did. I just had a quick question. Thank you, Mayor Sullivan, um, for the update. And thank you for um, constantly updating us with Dr. Herman. Um, I, I, quick question. Is there something we can do to help? Um, I mean, I ran into this personally last week, a three hour wait at Massasoit. Is there any way we can reach out to the state to, to give Brockton help as far as I think our numbers would be a lot higher if people are getting turned away. And I was one of them. And I was only going as a precautionary last week um, because I was in the vicinity of someone that had tested positive. So I figured I need to check, keep everybody safe around me. Um, but my, my main concern is, is I got turned away twice and, and they're like, come back. And we're talking about, it opens at seven at Massasoit. People are there at five o'clock. I mean, there's gotta be something that the state can help us where our numbers are so high. Um, so people are getting frustrated and just leaving, um, which is kind of concerning because if, if they're positive, they're going back out there because they can't, they don't have the opportunity to get tested. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I had this exact same conversation with your sister today. Um, Madam President Azak, uh, City Council President Shirley Azak was on a call with me and the state delegation, which was Claire Cronin. Uh, Rep Cassidy couldn't make it. Rep Dubois was there and Senator Brady was there as well. Uh, and we're all frustrated. I was tested last Friday uh, at Neighborhood Health Center, which is an appointment only uh, with uh, two family members. I got my results on Saturday. One of my family members didn't get it until Monday and one got it back today. In terms of the uh, no appointment at Massasoit to stop the spread, um, I just wanna make people clear and, and understanding that that's not run by the city. Again, that's the state mm -hmm. stop the spread, but there was some confusion, but I did get on a call last week with Bill Mitchell and Sarah units at Massasoit and the police chief over there as well, as well as the uh, Fallon ambulance CEO Fallon is running that. And I concur with you. I mean, to have a three or four hour delay uh, makes no sense. I will say that um, representative Claire Cronin was on the call with me today and Claire has reached out again to uh, secretary Sutter's, we need more testing. The governor came down with increased stop to spread testing, but it doesn't help Brockton at all. Um, town manager Brian Howard and I were on a call today. Brian is the town manager in Randolph, and Randolph has a stop to spread. Uh, same thing with him. I mean, they're, they're sending people away. So I, I echo your sentiments, Joyce, absolutely. Uh, and I will continue to be uh, diligent and talk to the state officials. Um, increased testing only makes sense. Uh, and I'm on a call again tonight with Mayor Walsh and some other mayors, and uh, we'll, we'll keep reiterating that. So um, I will tell you that the governor's rollback today um, doesn't change anything in Brockton. Uh, the rollback means uh, exactly what we're doing right now. Anybody that was in a, any municipality that was in a red classification was already in this rollback status. So it doesn't, it doesn't help or help, uh, hurt Brockton right now because we were already there. So um, I will share... Um, um, school committee woman, I'll, I'll share your concerns as well when I speak to L Lieutenant Governor Polito as well, because it's uh, just counterproductive to send people away that may be positive. It, it, it was um, it was definitely an eye opener, um, you know, just getting turned away and you're there two hours early. Um, so it just in my concern, our numbers are really high and there's got to be something that the state can do, especially where we're, we're discussing about possibly bringing some of our students back. Um, I can't imagine, you know, especially if more people are getting tested now during the holidays, but I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, it just, um, they, they need to step up and help Brockton a little. 
where our numbers are escalating. Um, so thank, thank you for all your hard work. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Joyce. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and thank you, Mayor. Anyone else have uh, any questions or comment on, um, on this matter before we move on? All right, seeing none, we'll continue with the agenda. Um, Superintendent Thomas revisiting revisit the reopening plan. As we spoke um, last week, we continue to um, look at a hybrid model. We continue to work with the um, district design team, uh, look at other models across the state. As you know, we had um, attorney Paige Tobin and uh, special education director Laurie Mason with us last week, um, talking about students with disabilities um, there are about 300 and I believe 85 students that we would look to phase back in, obviously when fate, uh, safe to do so. Um, in this past Friday, we, um, at, during the urban superintendent's meeting last Friday, um, the associate commissioner, um, there is a pilot program that would expand testing for school districts who are full remote, uh, looking to go into a hybrid model where there would be an option for testing students and staff. Um, obviously, it, it's something that we can't make. I don't think we can make it mandatory. We could obviously speak to our attorneys about that, but uh, it would be free testing. Um, the Department of Ed is looking into it. They asked for um, volunteer districts to sign up, so I did sign us up for that. Um, there'll be a webinar coming up soon so I can get more information about it, but um, that's something that's on the horizon that may help us. Um, when we look to bring students back to school in a hybrid model. So uh, as you know, um, you know, next week we take a vote on uh, looking at um, a possibility of when to bring our students with special needs back and then um, phasing some other students in. Uh, but that's where we are right now. We continue to plan. We have a plan, obviously. Uh, I, we've been on the phone with first student. Um, vans and buses would be ready to roll uh, obviously, they need some time to, to get things in order, bring some drivers back, but um, I'm confident once again, it's safe to do so, we would be able to start phasing students back in and we'll continue to work with our, our unions um, and still and talk about a hybrid model, which we continue to do. Um, and Mayor, I, uh, Mayor sorry, uh, Superintendent, I did talk with um, Sarah uh, spot for about um, the issue of testing students. And I know other members of the committee, I know Mr. Minicello isn't here, but he had, you know, raised concerns about, about wanting us to be able to do that. And I know we've all kind of talked about it. She was of the opinion that, uh, that we couldn't. Um, and um, so there was a, uh, uh, a document drafted by a member of her firm on this matter. She's supposed to be sending that over to me. And as, as soon as I get it, I'll share it with all of you um, so that you all have the chance to, to review their, their stance on it and, and their reasoning behind it. Um, but, you know, we may be able to do like you had said, voluntary, but um, as you had alluded to, you weren't, didn't think we could make it mandatory. And she had kind of uh, basically confirmed that as well. So uh, I'll remind her about, about that, getting me that document and, and I'll make sure I share it with everybody so that you have it. Um, any uh, comment or question on this uh, agenda item? Okay, seeing none, I think we can move on to uh, winter sports. And uh, I believe, unless superintendent wanted to jump in first, we have uh, Kevin Cairo with us. Yeah, I'll have um, AD Cairo um, just bring us up to date on his work with, with our league. Um, as far as this, uh, um, I guess, Mr. Cairo, it's December 14th. Uh, which yeah. is next uh, Monday that we're allowed to begin. Uh, I know that you have a plan in place. You've spoken to Stoughton, who um, mm -hmm. we co-op with with hockey, and then also we have a plan um, if a winter sports are approved, but obviously spread students out in in um, our four compass middle schools using the, um, as much space as possible. Um, but I'll let Mr. Cairo update us on. Um, on our league and, and um, how they are planning to proceed with us. Yeah, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'll make this short, sweet and simple and not to repeat what we did last week, but uh, it, the MIAA has um, allowed winter sports to begin across the state. 
on December the 14th, which would be next Monday. Um, we just need either the school committee to say, yes, we can do this, or if we need to revisit this again, uh, that's fine. As far as the sports that we would uh, allow this winter would be boys and girls basketball, gymnastics, and ice hockey. And like Mike said earlier, uh, when it came to practice time, we would separate as many teams as we can, especially with basketball. Um, so we don't have a lot of bodies in the gym coming and going and waiting to get picked up by parents or brothers or sisters. So that is the plan. Um, and as far as swim went, uh, we would separate our boys and girls teams for practice times. We would separate the boys and girls meets. The meets would be all virtual. So there would be no other schools coming into Brockton High School. Uh, the same thing with our gymnastics program that's run out of spectrum. They are not allowing any spectators in, and we would um, we would host those meets and compete in those meets virtually. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions? Uh, looks like uh, Mrs. Sullivan. Go right ahead. Hello. Good evening, uh, Mr. Cairo. I just wanted to ask. Um, in the sports that were held in the fall, yes. did um, how was the um, the rate of the virus was, I know they were wearing masks and trying to follow the, mm -hmm. you know, the, so, the social distance and the mm -hmm. um, hand washing and everything. But did you, did you have a good success rate with um, the virus um, amongst the participants that were in fall sports? We did. We, we put a, a good uh, procedure in place where every student had to fill out a form um, that asked if they had been around anybody that they tested positive, that if they had any symptoms. So before they could actually practice, they had to show their coach on their phone that, um, that that's how we did our contact tracing. And we had hand sanitizer everywhere. We disinfected equipment. The kids wore masks and, and we did not have one positive case. We didn't have to shut down any team. Um, because of a positive, a positive case, that wasn't the issue. I mean, the, the case in other schools, other schools did come up with it and they shut down for two weeks, but we, we were very fortunate. We did not have one, one player on any of our teams in the fall um, come down with the virus. Great, great job. Um, thank you. And let the coaches know also that that's really great news. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to uh, comment on, on this matter? Uh, Mr. Minicello, please. Hi, everyone. Sorry that I just got in, but um, um, I spoke to a couple parents about this uh, who are very um, in favor, you know, of having their students um, involved, you know, in the winter sports program. And, you know, and I said to them, listen, I said, you, you, you have to understand, you know, where the school committee is and, and you know, our concern for, um, you know, the health of our students and, um, and the public. I said, but ultimately, whether a student participates is a family decision. And that's what I told this, a couple of these parents. I said, you know, um, if, if we vote in favor, you know, you know who your child is exposed to you know if your child is gonna be near your elderly mom or your elderly father or your aunt or your uncle. So it's a family decision. So, um, uh, you know, we cannot protect the world against everything, but you know, understand that it's, it, it's your responsibility to basically, you know, monitor your child's exposure to people um, after they participate in a sport um, and whether they participate in that sport is, you know, a family decision, you know, knowing you know, what's certainly going on in our community. So, um, you know, my, my, you know, just, I, you know, in my conversation, I said, look at, you know, if, if, if we get an indication that it is a, a, a situation that is not, you know, uh, inherently unsafe, I will vote in favor of it, but it's ultimately your responsibility as the parent to give your kid the final blessing and you know, to know in, in his, in your household, in your, you know, in your family's household, your relatives, your close friends, you know, who 
may be vulnerable and who your child should not be near just in case. So, so that's, that's on you, you know, and that's your responsibility. So that, that's my two cents worth. All right. Um, and before I comment, does and, any- Oh, and they agreed and the parent agreed, totally agreed, understood, you know, understood. He said, you know, I do have elderly parents, but I understand what you're saying and you're right. That is my, that is my responsibility, you know, so. So acknowledge what I was saying and, and said, you know, it makes perfect sense, you know. Right. And I'm glad to hear that they that they agree. Um, yeah. Before I comment, are you all set? Sorry. I, am, thanks, thanks. I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. No, no, you didn't. You didn't. Thank you, Mark. All right. Uh, any other member of the committee want to comment before I do so? All right. Um, so I actually I agree with what, what Mr. Minicello said. Uh, you know, I have a few reasons. Um, first, again, I think this is a family decision, a parent's choice. They don't have to participate in sports. Um, you know, it's something that parents can decide if they're comfortable and if they feel it's safe for their family and their kids, then then they can make that decision to participate. Um, the, the rink is open. Uh, we've successfully had sports programs uh, already um, this fall. Uh, with and 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 uh, we didn't have any. Is that correct, uh, Ad Cairo? We didn't have any cases no. uh, with the participants. Um, you know, so I think we've we've shown that this can be done. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, I think this is one that we need to let parents and their students uh, and families make make their own decision on this. Um, and also. This has been going on since March, and this is a chance for these students who are at home all the time to get out a little bit. And, and you know, and I think that's important because I am, uh, and I'm not the only one, but becoming very, very concerned about the mental health and mental well being that's going along with the, uh, you know, being shut in and not seeing people and all of that. So I, I think there's, there's also that element for just for me um, that, uh, you know, we have this opportunity that so far has been done very safely. It's smaller groups of people. It's a very controlled situation. So, all right. Any other member of the committee want to comment? Um, we do need a vote on this, a recommendation to the full committee for next Tuesday, um, either in favor of winter sports or in, in against winter sports. So if somebody wanted to uh, make- I'll make a, a motion. Thank you. Oh. Just motion one thing, oh, Mr. sorry, sorry Mr. Minicello, uh, just one thing, if you could put in the motion to allow uh, Mr. K. Rowe to move forward, obviously Tuesday night is the day, two would be two days into the start. Okay. So if I we could you. just okay. give him the authority to begin um, the process of everything that needs to happen to start and on Monday, um, if you just put, put that into the motion. Sure, I, I make you. a motion to have the Brockton Public Schools uh, participate in the uh, up and coming winter sports program uh, and make that recommendation um, for the next school committee meeting. And I also make the motion in favor of allowing uh, Mr. Cairo to do all uh, preliminary um, associated work in order to make that happen uh, prior to that school committee meeting um, uh, as, as he deems uh, necessary and required to meet, the to meet the appropriate timeline for winter sports. Second. Is that, Second. Is that okay? Does that cover it, Michael and Mr. Cairo? Yes. Okay, right. Mr. Yes. Superintendent, sorry. Okay. Very yeah, good. <laughs> so we have a, a motion by Mr. Minicello um, and uh, I, I heard Mrs. Sullivan make the second. Uh, I'm so proud that Mrs. Sullivan made that second. Thank you, Judy, for supporting <laughs> I'm that. I'm proud that you made the first <laughs> one. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. You can um, word it better than me. Tom, can I clarify that that was basically uh, both items you're you're putting that in as one single motion? Yes, right? one motion. Yeah, one recommendation to the full committee. Correct. Um, so we have a uh, a motion on the floor, properly seconded. Uh, any discussion before I call the roll? All right, I'm going to call the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right, D'Agostino is a yes. Ms. Asac. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes, please. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. All right. 
So moved, motion passes unanimously. Okay. All right, and, and thank you, Tom. I don't think I've ever gotten a please on, on yes, please, wow. Um, I'm right. trying to be, I'm trying to be nicer, you know? <laughs> it is Christmas. I mean, you can be Grinch the other 11 months. Oh, uh, <laughs> All right, item number four, data information, Superintendent Thomas. Yeah, so recently first term just closed. So um, he, uh, Dr. Cancel is gonna do a presentation on our first term um, and then um, we'll answer any questions after that. All right, Dr. Cancel, the floor is yours. Now I'm unmuted, thank you very much. I just need to um, share my screen, close something that is a very, very large um, spreadsheet and then open up this PowerPoint. So if you just bear with me a second. Excuse me, I'm going to have to. I'm hoping this is. All right. So I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Let me get up to the top. Is there a title page on the front? Yes, we can see it. Yes, it is. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, it's great to be here. It's always fun to talk about data. Today, we're talking about uh, the first term grades and some attendance data. So I just want to, uh, these are the ELA grades, and I just want to say something at the very uh, beginning. These are what I'll call straight grades. They're not weighted. There's no extra points for being in honors or AP. If you have an A plus, an A minus, or an A, it's all in the A category. It's just to give you a large overview of um, how the grades shake out. And what we have on the left side is this year's grades for ELA. And on the right side, we have last year's grades, first term uh, for ELA. And you can see that the failure rate is clearly higher this year. And these are for grades six through 12 because our elementary school has a standard space report card. So I can't give you the same sort of information about grade distribution because they're standards uh, based and they work towards achieving those standards over the course of the year, as opposed to um, the secondary level where you get a grade for the first term, the second term, third term and fourth. So as you can see, the, um, the rates for A's are very similar. The B's have slid down a little for this year compared to last year and um, you know, the Ds have also gone up. So what do you see here? You definitely see um, a um, unusual or bimodal distribution. It's not a normal distribution. It's not the normal bell curve, but that's okay. That, that doesn't mean anything. It just is what it is. But you can see that the top end seems to be fairly consistent with last year, but it's the... Um, the bottom end where there's more, um, more students. So that's, that's an area of some concern. Okay, so this is math, same situation. You've got 2020 on the left, 2019 on the right. And what you see is there are actually more students this year getting A's than last year. But unfortunately, you also have more students getting F's than last year. So it's 19.9% um, getting Fs. And my screen just, there it goes, it went black on me. 19.9% getting Fs um, this year and 11% last year. So we can see that that is going on. 
This is the science. And once again, it's a similar story. The, the top end, uh, the, the A's, that A minus, A's and A pluses, virtually the same, 28.8% versus 29%. But the F's, 10 percentage points higher. So they're clearly, um, the pandemic affects people differently. This tries to break down the grades by um, each grade level because it's not the same. The average hides a, a lot of variation by grade level. So what you see on the left is the percent that of students who are failing um, English term one. And on the right, you see last year's first term, the percent. And what you see is, the ninth and 10th graders are really struggling. It's always been, Mike can tell you about this, you know, as long as we've been doing this, as long as school's been, that I know of high schools that have been running, ninth grade is a hard year. It's a, it's a big transition. And this year, because of the pandemic, 10th grade is also a particularly hard year. Normally, uh, you know, we look at 2019, which is pretty representative of our data, you see that it, the failure rates drop off. Um, at the middle grade levels, they're higher than they were, but they're still lower. So, um, but the- Ethan, age... I'm gonna jump in real quick. Sure. Yep. So just, I wanna add a couple things. So I spent 10 years at the high school um, and um, Sharon and I actually were co-chairs of a, um, a committee that concentrated on ninth grade um, because failure rates were always the highest am amongst ninth graders. So, uh, and this obviously we're in person. Uh, a lot of other things that contributed this year, obviously ninth, eighth grade is moving up now and ninth graders and never being to the high school um, or any high school. Again, this is for all our high schools in the um, Brockton. Uh, so the transition alone in normal times is really hard for eighth to ninth grade. And we've always struggled with that transition. It's pretty much everyone across the country struggles with with ninth graders. But it's also important to note that um, the high school and middle schools um, and the um, our alternative schools, they always run a great credit recovery program um, when we're in person. Um, and that usually brings our failure rates down. That has not been able to happen. Uh, we're hoping to get that up and running for the, it usually doesn't start till the second term anyway. So you'll see some of those failure rates come down when we, when we run credit recovery. But also it's that loss of summertime where we spend a lot of time with our eighth graders, you know, helping them with extra programs, summer programs that we weren't allowed to do this year, um, which also would help bring our failure rate down. But, you know, just a couple of things I wanted to note in there. Thank you so much for the uh, context, which is really helpful to understand. Um, not surprisingly, since overall the A's are not uh, very different. They're slightly different in terms of percentage six through 12. You can see that within the different grade bands, they're similar. There are some exceptions. The percentage of students in grade six is down substantially, but in other grades, it remains virtually the same. You know, grade seven is virtually the same. I think that what the superintendent has um, pointed out is really important. Transitions are never easy. And this year we weren't able to do the in-person in transitions that we normally do. So you take a transition, which we know is hard across the country and you sort of make it as difficult as it can be and don't be surprised at the outcomes. But in general, you can see that there's not a, a ton of difference on the ELA side um, at the high end. These are the rates for math. And you can see, I don't have to go over every single uh, chart because they're, they're similar. They're very similar charts. These are the A rates. Again, to me, it's a very similar story. You know, you see a little bit of variation. There are some areas of concern. Um, again, it's, it's nothing that uh, by now we can't anticipate. And by now, I mean this point in the presentation. Science is a little bit different. Science people have really struggled. And, you know, imagine you're used to having labs, you're used to doing hands-on work in person, and now you're plain old not. And so 
I think that may have something to do with it. Um, so the interesting thing to me was the high end of science, you know, it, it, it's still able to be not exactly where it was, but not far from it. Now, this was something that, you know, the superintendent has made an absolute priority to take a look at the subgroup performance. And you do begin to see some substantial differences when you start to peel back the, the averages and you look inside. So we, we talked about all students, but now we're looking on the left side and we're only looking at this year's because this is what's important, the kids in front of us this year. You look at the students who are not English learners, this is English, the ELA grade, versus on the right side, the students who are English language learners. And you almost see the reverse image, the mirror image. So you see very few, relatively speaking, 16%, 16.8% of the students getting Fs, still higher than we'd like, but it's a lot lower than 32% getting Fs. So the kids who are not English learners get Fs at a much lower rate, half the rate of students who are English learners, and they um, get As at more than twice the rate. Now again, this does not have any weighting. It doesn't talk about you know who's in honors and who's not. But for straight grades, you know, on average, these are the results. So it's very important to look at the uh, subgroups here. So um, you can see the, the same sort of thing um, in math on this slide. It's that sort of mirror image. So the left side is not an English learner. The right side is an English learner. And this is, um, I should say that if, if you're noticing that the slides are different, you see, you know, 2019, 2020. So the first one we do is 2020. The second one we do is 2019. It's the same kind of story. You can say, oh, you know, they're affected a little bit. Yes, they are affected a little bit more, but, um, you know, you, you definitely see that uh, the scores are impacted. Here's science, this is uh, 2020. And it's, you know, unfortunately uh, not so radically different. So here is the students with disabilities. I have to tell you that there are far fewer students with disabilities in terms of overall numbers than um, English learners. Some English learners also have um, our students with disabilities, but the the you know if we have roughly speaking, it's not quite a third, but let's just say a third of our students are English learners. We don't have that. We're we're half that um, for students with disabilities. So this is the uh, 2019 year, and you can still see that there's um, it's the exact same format. You can see that there's uh, a similar sort of um, outcome. It is different. You know, the uh, the students who are not uh, with disabilities certainly last year had more A's and B's in English. Here's the story in math. And, um, you know, they're not, radically different stories. Um, you know, the, the thing that I think is important, if you look over at the percentage of students getting Fs, the percentage without uh, student, without disabilities, 10%, 10.5% versus 15%. You'd think that having a disability would predict that you'd have a much higher failure rate, but that's not the case. It is higher. There's no two ways about it, but it's not you know, three times the amount, four times the amount. So I think that's worth noting. Same thing in you know, this, this current year. So we see that um, while 
I guess the way I'm trying to say it is I know that there's a lot of talk about bringing our most vulnerable students back. And I certainly am sympathetic to that, but realize students with disabilities typically are in that category. And while they're certainly struggling, they're, they're struggling as much as their peers. You know, the five, roughly speaking, five percentage points, roughly speaking, four percentage points, five percentage points. It's, it's not really different year to year. So we have that. We go into science, students with disabilities on the left. Uh, I'm sorry, without disabilities on the left, with disabilities on the right. And you can see that there is a substantial difference here. There was a substantial difference the previous year as well. Okay, so then you put them all together. Uh, you put the, if you are, if you're a student who is not an English learner and does not have a disability compared to those students, and we don't have that many of them who are English learners and have a disability, and you compare them, you see that there are substantially uh, different outcomes for these students. This is this year, and we see that there are substantially different outcomes last year. This is it for math, and you see a 10-point difference at the uh, the group of students who are getting Fs, and you see a um, very large difference in the percentage of students who get A's in math. And this is the previous year. You know, you still see these large differences. This is the science side, and this is the previous year's science side. I did want to say something, and I was, you know, scrambling because, um, you know, I showed this to the executive team in the morning, and the obvious question was, well, what about the elementary school? How are they doing? And as I pointed out, it's really difficult for me to say something because of the standard space report cards. We are, I can tell you that we are working on altering the uh, and improving the report cards. It was in our plan to do it last year and we we're making great progress <laughs> and the pandemic hit and we're now um, back at it. So we will be able to change, but I, I wanted to put something together that was intuitive and you could really understand it and just say, oh, okay, this makes sense to me. So I put together, this is for the STAR um, test that was given in the, in the fall. And you can see the uh, lighter yellow on the, the slide on the left is the reading part of it. And the slide on the right in the blue is the uh, math part of it. The lighter color for the reading is last year's. And if I was smart, I would have kept it consistent. But the truth is I finished this two minutes before the, you know, the meeting. So I, I wasn't smart enough to do that. But grade equivalent, the average grade equivalent, which I have to warn you is a shaky measure at best. But I said, okay, we'll just, we'll put it together and we'll see how we did this year compared to last year. Roughly speaking, the average grade in third grade was the, the 2.4 grade level. So that's, you know, you're almost halfway through uh, grade level. This year, when you started, you're at 2.5. We did mention that there was that, you know, strange outcome in uh, third grade. Every other grade went down, third grade went up, but it is what it is. And what you're seeing is there aren't wild differences. So um, you can also see that the grade equivalent is below the actual grade where you'd expect. This isn't a, uh, it's an unfortunate finding, but it's not unique and it's not unusual. This does capture summer slide, which is one of the reasons why um, there's a lot of emphasis around the state to try to um, do something about the summer slide. And that was one of the things the commissioner was trying to push prior to us not getting any funding with the Student Opportunity Act. But that's another story for another day. The math side, uh, similar story. 
So what you can say is, yeah, you know, it's, it's not quite, we're not doing quite as well as last year, but on average, we're not doing substantially, you know, noticeably worse. So are we behind? Yes, we are. Um, is it, you know, irretrievable? No, and I think that's the conclusion that I want people to walk away with. It, it, I think there's a lot of sensationalism in the press about you know a lost generation. I don't believe that. I simply don't believe it. I don't think there's evidence to support it. And in terms of the data that we're seeing, we are seeing outcomes that we're not thrilled about, but it's not um, you know sensational. Okay, so here's the attendance data, and I have to warn you, this is not official. If you were to try to find this on the department website, you'd find numbers that are different. They don't report it this way. This is not our official um, data, but this is a quick sketch and using the exact same methodology as able to calculate the previous year. And if you look all the way over on the right, you see that we have a attendance rate of 92.2 at this part of the year, which you can say, well, what does that mean? Well, I can tell you it's pretty close to what our attendance rate was last year. In fact, it's very close, within a tenth of a point. So um, that's the data. It's, um, there's a lot of it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I just want to also add out, um, Ethan, that you know this is the reason why we pushed for the Student Opportunity Act. Um, you know, this is why um, we need the money going forward. You, you think back last fall, um, I'm sorry, the spring, we shut down um, a lot of school districts who obviously are well-funded. Um, you know, they flip a switch. Every kid already had a computer. They had a learning management system. Um, the teachers had training um, and they had been doing it for a few years. And you know, they were able to roll out remote learning and, and pretty much stay consistent, you know, through the whole spring. And then us, we had a, you know, thank God the CARES Act came through uh, from the federal government, which allowed us to buy the 10,000 computers. And, um, you know, and then we were able to do that. And then teachers obviously uh, in Brockton had, had not been trained for remote learning and we weren't ready for this and we were able to switch over um, you know, so this, again, plays into the importance of um, the funding um, for us. And also that, you know, we knew this first term was going to be a struggle. That's why we waived the automatic failure. We'll have to decide on that soon, whether we want to do that for the second term. But I think that as we get into second term, um, teachers are really working hard to, um, you know, to, um, you know, craft uh, and hone the uh, remote learning skills. And I think they're doing a great job. And I think term two, uh, we'll see better numbers. There'll be some credit recovery programs. There's some after school tutoring programs now coming out of community schools. So again, I think things will start to get that get better. But again, it's concerning. This is a reason why, you know, there's no substitute for in-person learning. There's just no substitute. Um, Thank you, Ethan. Okay, I see Mr. Minicello's got his hand up. Hi there. Um, uh, Ethan, what is our e e English language learner number right now for the school district? Where are we at? What um, percent, percentage wise? Right, I, I say that it's roughly speaking a third, it's less than a third, but there, the way you calculate it is funny. And it's, um, you know, if you were an English learner last year, and your score is good enough so that you're not an English learner this year, you still get counted. But, um, you know, there's a little bit of motion in that, but I would say roughly speaking, 25%. Okay, so I mean, so, so a, a quarter to a third of our yeah. student body. I mean, we basically discussed this this is very predictable. We, we've already discussed this. We knew where we were at. Do you remember the meeting maybe a month ago? Um, I said that we need to, um, with regard to this segment of the population, whether these students are in the high school or in the schools, 
I honestly don't think it matters. I do not think it's going to be a significant, a significant increase of percentage wise that these grades are going to be all that much better. Will it be a little bit better? Yeah, but I still say it's going to be very alarming. We need, when it comes to the English language learner population, we have to be able to deliver the curriculum and deliver it to a large segment of our student body in a way that um, is better um, digested, understood. Um, you're not going, in my opinion, my unscientific non-teaching um, background, just common sense tells me that a gen ed, um, a non-English language learner who, who, like myself, was in the school system, you know, since, since the kindergarten, first grade, growing up in Brockton, you know, is going to have an easier time, and the numbers show it, than a kid that sh shows up, you know, in the sixth grade, seventh grade, from, from wherever, um, and English is not his, you know, um, primary language. I mean, it's just, it's just the, the reality of it. If I went to Haiti, if I went to Cape Verde and I'm gonna, from, from Brockton, Massachusetts, not really knowing the language all that well, I'd be lucky to get a D, I would think, I don't know, in, in English or well, in, 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 you know, in whatever language they're teaching me there. Um, so I just think this is a very predictable situation in terms of um, where we have been at. And yes, it, there's a funding element to it. We need money to, um, you know, to, make changes, but we, we need to know what to do. Um, and then we have to figure out what, you know, what the amount of money we need to do it, you know? So, um, you know, I'd be curious what other, um, what other um, gateway cities are at with regard to their statistics, but, but regardless, you know, we have to do better. And I think it's a matter of changing up the curriculum for this segment of our population, which is significant. 25 to 30% is huge. Um, yes, the computer, the having computers in every kid's hand is wonderful. But again, if I, if I, if someone handed me a computer, you know, and, I, and I'm in Haiti, and I just know English, and I'm supposed to, you know, answer the questions and do the work and take the test and, and you know, in, in French Creole or whatever, you know, whatever language, I don't care if I have I have the best you know Apple IBM whatever computer in my hot little hand I'm still going to not do that great you know so so it's really to me how we deliver to this segment of the population and and again in this segment of the population there's huge differences you know it's not like you're saying oh these are all Italian kids that are English language learners these are all you know Cape Verdean kids no in our English language learner um, population you and I, we all know, everyone in the school committee knows how many different students from different places, you know, these, these kids are coming from. So um, you, you have to, I think, deliver in a lot of different ways to deliver to a lot of different um, backgrounds, a lot of different um, places where unique places where people come from. And um, I think that's the challenge. You know, yes, if the kids all went back to school, would they be a little bit better? Yeah, they'd be a little bit better, but I don't think that we'd be saying, oh, you know, we're out of the red zone. Look at how good we're doing. Absolutely not. I just think we'd be a little bit better, not a heck of a lot better. So. Yeah, the, the data support you on that completely. And um, that's why I think it's really important for us to experiment. You were 100% right. You know, we don't have a monolithic English learner population. We have a large and a varied English learner population. So experimentation, trying new things, um, and of course the, the funding, and uh, you know, it's it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, we have to come up with the plan. The funding will have to follow, but we need to know what the plan is to say, this is what we need to do, and this is how much it's gonna cost, but we need to know what to do, you know? Yep. Well, and I think in our last meeting, I, I, we had had this very discussion, you know, about needing that, you know, yes, we've got devices for the kids, but we also need the appropriate curriculum um, and appropriate training for the teachers as well. Um, you know, we needed to have all three. So um, I, again, you know, I think it's pretty uh, obvious what we need to do. Maybe we need to, from here, start to uh, look into, you know, what else we need. We've got the devices now. You know, um, we can start to work on 
on the curriculum that we need to, um, again, you know, um, start making, uh, making, you know, moving, being able to move kids forward um, and recognizing the students that are in front of us and, and curriculum we need to, to be able to move these students forward. Um, any other comment or question from the members of the committee? Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Just a comment, Ethan. I just wanted to say uh, all the data and the graphs that you presented were it's fabulous the way you do it. I don't know how you can uh, put everything together like that. And I just wanted to say that it looks like we're doing better. I thought it would be really bad being remote. It looks like we're doing better than we I thought we would. And I just wanted to thank you for all the work you've done to put this graph together, all the data. It's a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, would anybody else like to uh, chime in before we uh, move on? Okay. Um, and I think if we can maybe get for a future meeting, um, you know, if uh, the superintendent and his team can start to look at, you know, again, I think we, unless I'm misunderstanding everybody, I think we seem to agree that, you know, we need to take a look at curriculum. So maybe, um, you know, that work, if it hasn't already begun, can be begin so we can start to, to look into this as a committee. Um, all right, if there's no other comment on this, then we'll go to other business. Is there an item of other business to come before the policy subcommittee? Superintendent Thomas. Uh, just a quick update. Um, I did get the signs. Um, you have uh, a copy of the MOU between uh, Desi and us. Um, it was signed um, by the commissioner, uh, the same copy that you have. So um, I will um, sign that tomorrow. And then at the December 15th meeting, uh, two liaisons for um, from the Department of Ed will will join us in the uh, the Zoom school committee meeting, and um, we'll go over the MOU. Um, and a lot of a lot of the things you talk about tonight, as far as um, reviewing curriculum, um, edu you know, education for bilingual students. I mean, it's all in there, um, and obviously, we'll all be part of the new strategic plan as we uh, build it going forward. So, I just wanted to add that on the other business just to keep you updated on that. Great, all right, thank you very much, Superintendent. Any other item of other business to come before policy? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn by Mrs. Sullivan. Do we have a second? Second, second by Mr. Sullivan. Okay, I will call the roll. Uh, Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Agostino is a yes. Ms. Uh, Ms. Asak? Yes. Mrs. Mendez? Yes. Mr. Minicello? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. All right, policy subcommittee is adjourned. Um, we'll just take a you know, five minute break and, and come back for uh, curriculum, all right?